thy rod and thy staff. Those things guide me. Now, you see this here? I'm going to tell you, when you have somebody that's dealing with cattle, they're driving the cattle. Yeah, you know, and get those things to move. But I'll tell you what, when you have sheep, it's not so much the rod where you might have to deal with the straying sheep and break their legs. It really isn't that. It is more of the staff and the shepherd's staff and just realizing that the shepherd is the one that cares for the sheep. He's thinking of the sheep. He is um, concerned <laughs> for the sheep and, and, and he's not just beating the sheep. He's not trying to, you know, just make his point and, and push it into them, but he is absolutely trying to help the sheep prompt them along, bring them along, and develop them, and care about them with their wounds and all. And so, how should a shepherd act? And, and I think you know. And how would you act as a parent towards your child, or as a friend towards somebody who's struggling? And so, we've got to make sure that we're not the, the, the rod kind of people. And, and I understand some people really love that. They're thinking, just take the rod to them. And, and, but that really isn't um, the kindest and the best answer and, and the tone that the Lord wants to set for the church. So I, I want to share with you guys a scripture. And this is in 1 Corinthians, and it's in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians. And, you know, and, and I would say as I've been talking about these things, and I'm not going to talk a lot about the end times, but in the midst of the end times, this is how we ought to be. In the midst of living in a crooked and perverse generation, in the midst of um, dealing with a lot of people that don't know right from left and up from down, we've got to be this way that I'm going to talk about right now. And so it speaks of the Apostle Paul who, who wrote this, penned by the Holy Spirit through him, and, and showing his, his fatherly, his paternal care, his shepherd's heart, and, and not the, um, the rod, and not the beating of the sheep. So it starts out in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, and I want to say a prayer with you, okay? So let's pray. Let's bring it down from heaven, okay? Lord, we just come before you. We thank you, Lord God, that you hear us from heaven. We thank you, Lord, that you always hear us. We thank you that you always love us. We thank you, Lord, that you're always with us. And I pray right now for your sheep who will listen. I pray for your sheep, Lord, who will be encouraged, Lord God, that you would touch their soul right now. Lord, you would touch their mind right now. Touch their understanding right now, Lord God, so they would know how you treat them. They will know how your shepherds and, and the people that you're developing them into be and how they would treat others. And so, Lord God, we now pray that you would just open our heart to all these good things. In Jesus' name, and what did we all say? Amen and amen, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so Paul's paternal care in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 14, it says, I do not write these things to shame you. It says, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Now, would you, if you knew that somebody had some problems in their life, would you like to embarrass them in front of everybody? Would you like to bring shame to them and announce it in front of everybody and go, oh, well, you know, so-and-so did such and such. And you know, people talk behind people's backs all the time. People say things that discourage other people or actually shame them, whether it be secretly and privately one-on-one -on -one or publicly. And so people kind of walk around with their heads down because of maybe the way they were treated by somebody else or even a pastor or even a church. And, and so we've got to make sure, like Paul said here, I, I don't write these things to shame you. You know, Jesus took our, our shame upon himself on that cross. And he is not looking to shame us. He says, but as beloved children, I warn you. And so sometimes there is a tone. Sometimes a parent has a little bit of a tone. Get out of the way. Hurry. Be safe. And, and in that tone, it's because of love. It's because of protection. And so warnings definitely are not bad. And so he says, as my beloved children, and, and so taking that, that fatherly heart, you are my flock that God's given me. You are the children that he's put into my care. And because of that, I've got to say things. I've got to save say things to protect you from the fire, say things to protect you from a, a destroyed life. And so sometimes we just need to hear things and not always said in the way that we might receive it. Because a lot of times we have certain trigger words and, and, and we lose track of what the person's saying and the heart behind what's being said. And we just kind of get caught up in the way that they said it. And we miss the important words that they might be saying. And so a pastor's job is sometimes to warn. A parent's job sometimes to warn. 
um, a loving brother or sister in Christ some time to warn a straying brother or sister in Christ. And so we aren't taking our Bibles, and this is with the Bible, you know, big, big, big Bible here, and we're not knocking them over the head with the Bible, and, and we're, not, we're not doing that in order to harm them and, and make them feel like, oh, I can't live up to all of this and live up to you, and I can't go on any further. We're not out to discourage people. We want to build them up. We want to encourage them. It doesn't mean that we derail true words and important words that somebody might need to hear. It doesn't mean that we silence ourselves or allow somebody else to silence us just because we couldn't say it so perfectly. But we have to have that, that nice balance between the truth and the way that we present the truth in the way that a person will receive it, in the way that a person will hear it, in the way that a person will be comforted by it rather than destroyed by it, feeling crushed in the way that you presented it. Um, there are definitely churches around that try to correct people. They try to correct somebody who is in adultery. They try to correct somebody who is looking at um, pornography. They try to protect, not protect, but um, correct somebody who is beating their wife. I mean, that happens. There's spousal abuse. And, and obviously, there's points in times where the law might even come in on things. But, but I'll tell you that when you're listening to people, and when you're hearing all of their junk, and believe me, the longer, the longer you're a Christian, the more junk you're going to hear. Because people are coming in from the world, and even people that are, um, have been out of the world a long time sometimes um, don't get this whole thing about living for Christ. And, and, so, and, and even the people who get it, there are definitely those points where maybe their maturity isn't quite what it should be, right? And so, so some churches look at somebody's life and they hear of something, and they, they beat the person over the head for it. They look at the person differently because of it. And they, they do not come at the person with kindness and with a walking through it in the long term with the person. But the person could actually be long forgotten once the person disappears because the person didn't feel loved or accepted, but they felt stared at. Now, I understand some people, you just tell them something true and they feel stared at regardless of how much you love them. And um, because it's their own, you know, psyche at work and um, making them, you know, perceive things differently than they are and they might miss out on the love of somebody else. But, but also we do know, and I'm sure you've known it, that there are definitely churches who definitely can be harsh. There's definitely pastors who can be harsh. There's definitely Christians that can be too conservative for their britches, right? And they can be harsh and they can miss out on the gentleness of Christ. And of course, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 talks about restoring such a one in the gentleness of Christ, considering yourself. Come on, who's without fault, right? Who's without sin? Let him pick up the first stone and cast it. And, and considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And I would say that sometimes if we are harsh to people, as a pastor being harsh to somebody that I'm counseling, or yourself as a Christian, just having a harshness in the way that you respond to something that they, a pearl that they laid out before you and you trampled on it. If that happens, sometimes the Lord will allow us to see our own weakness. The Lord doesn't tempt us. The Lord doesn't make us sin. But the Lord could definitely um, remove a little bit of his strength for a moment to show you that, you know, there go you and there are you and, and you better learn mercy and you better do justly and you better show the kindness of Jesus. And so, you know, th there is a true pathway in people's lives for where it says, I, I warn you as my beloved children, there's a true pathway for restoration, for healing, for falling down and getting back up and Christian helping Christian. There, there's definitely um, a good way rather than feeling like you've been bit and devoured by everybody and you've been thrown away by those that should have loved you. And, and the truth is, is people are going to fall and people do fall. It may be them, it may be you, but um, you know, if you don't show mercy, I don't think that you're going to be shown very much mercy by others. And, and yet, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't say anything. It doesn't mean that correction with a heart of love for God and a heart of love for that person, that that doesn't mean that it's not a good thing to, to do. And yet, the, the scriptures teach in Ephesians about speaking the truth in love. It doesn't mean that we dismiss the truth and that we don't speak the truth, but we speak the truth because we love Christ and we speak the truth because we love his people. And so we're not making them feel unloved in the midst of 
are speaking the truth to them. We let them know without deceiving them, because sometimes they know Christians can say, I'm telling you this because I really love you, but it's really because they're bugged or really because they just want to, you know, see, see you um, wiggle and, and squirm in when they're, when they're, you know, putting a tight squeeze on you and, and spiritualizing it. And, and yeah, there's a lot of weirdness that goes on, but, but truly speaking the truth in love is such an important thing in this world. And, you know, Jesus didn't even shame Peter after he denied him, did he? Didn't shame him. Peter, feed my sheep. I mean, that, that's our, our Jesus, the one who takes our shame, the, Lord, the one who moves us forward. And, and we have to be careful because there is the Bible, right? And the Old Testament, the law, and the New Testament, um, the grace of Jesus Christ. And so we do have to be so careful that we understand, even though it is written and even though it is true and truth and needs to be spoken, that it is done in the spirit of the law and not according to the letter of the law. Because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And that's what we wanna do, right? We wanna be encouraging. We wanna give life. We wanna speak encouragement and God's life into people and not where they feel all weary and wilted. You know, talking about shame for a moment, there's a plant, it actually has a proper name, but, um, but in the Philippines, one of the names they call it is the shame plant. And it's these little leaves and you go up and you touch it and they all close inward when you touch them. And I remember when I first learned about it, I would just go and touch each of those leaves and I want to watch them just close in. And, but yet some people are like that with people. Now, some people are just touchy, but then some people, when they're touched in a harsh way, they do close in. Now, the shame plants, within a few hours, they open back up. But sometimes people don't open back up. Sometimes people just feel shamed. And so Paul was so clear saying that I, I'm coming at you guys. I, I'm not writing you to shame you. He says, but as my beloved children, I warn you. First Corinthians chapter four. And so if you want somebody to come back to you and talk to you again, if you're kind to them, and if you handle the word of God in, in a loving way, they're gonna return to you again. They're not gonna be all closed up and feeling harmed by you. And also, there was um, one brother one time that said to another brother, well, you know, Proverbs 27, 6, you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So you're my friend, and so I'm just wounding you because I'm supposed to. I'm being faithful at the wounds of a friend. And, and you know, but really, the person was an enemy, and it was really the wounds of an enemy. And so, you know, there really is a way to treat another human being. One rule of thumb is the way that you want to be treated. And I, I don't think anybody wants to really be treated harshly. And yet, brother can viciously turn against brother. And somebody maybe that at one time you walked to the house of God with, you drove to the house of God with, and, and now they're, um, you know, just really have become your enemy. It says in Psalm 55, verse 12, it says, for it is not an enemy that reproaches me. And then, then I could bear it. It says, nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. He says, then I could hide from him, but it was you a man who's my equal, my companion and my acquaintance. And we took sweet counsel together and we walked to the house of God side by side. And, and, and so it's saying that like, even in the midst of a good friendship, people turn against each other. When the going gets tough for somebody, rather than picking up the brother that fell, we end up um, just falling into some weird thing of hurting that person. You've ever heard of that phrase about shooting the wounded. And so sometimes believer will shoot believer um, through the tongue and through those fiery darts and being used as a tool of the enemy. Another time a, a brother had shared with a brother because this brother had accountability with this brother and this brother shared things like, you know, deep things of the heart and, and struggles and, and temptations and those things. And in that particular instance, um, when that brother turned against that brother and they shared and they said, Ephesians chapter five, you shouldn't even speak about those things that are done by them in secret. And so once again, now that takes away from the fact that somebody can open their heart to somebody else and share deep things to another person. If a person can't share maybe some of the falls or some of the failures or some of the temptations that they've had in their life. And, and so sometimes people will use the word of God harshly and incorrectly toward another person. And when that happens, a person um, becomes defensive to the Bible itself. They become afraid of Ephesians chapter five. And every time they read it, they're triggered by that. 
or they've had situations where maybe somebody was confronted and dealt with harshly in a church and every time they drive past that church they have that sensation of all of that negativity that rises up from that memory the the church PTSD that they have now I believe as Christians people can get past anything I believe through Jesus Christ a person can rise above a lot of the religious PTSD that people throw upon each other and that that people take upon themselves um, but it says in Ephesians 5, 11 and 12, it says, but rather expose them. So we're talking about exposing somebody, right? It says, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. And that's the verse I was quoting, Ephesians 5, 11 and 12. And, and how people can talk about light exposes darkness. And then they say, but now everything you've shared with me, I need to go tell somebody else. But then I'm even going to lie about it. You know, it's interesting how people can't always trust people. But Paul was saying, I'm not saying any of these things to shame you. I'm writing to my little children to, to warn you so that way you can stay on track. And, and I'll tell you, God's got a good track for us to stay on. You know, sometimes people do kind of come off a little holy like um, Judas did about the money that was being wasted through the fragrant oil that was put upon him. And, and really, it wasn't because he cared about the poor when he mentioned that, but that he really only cared about the money box and that if that had been sold and given to the Lord, he could have taken money out of the money box because the Bible says that he was a thief. So a lot of times people who are not kind to other people, they've got pride going on in their own heart. They've got thievery or something that rips off other people. And, and sometimes people do, rather than encourage and pour into other people, people drain other people. People zap the life out of other people and they, they, they hurt them. And this is where we as believers have to try to not be on the side of hurting others. And, and that, that when we come at the flock and at his people to minister to them, we're coming to them in such a way that we don't have an ulterior motive in, in why we're doing it for some selfish reason, but we're doing it because we really love Christ and because we really love them. Um, in Ephesians 6.22, Paul talks about a brother that he had sent. I sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your heart. Now that's Ephesians 6.22. Paul was sending a brother to comfort their hearts. And I believe that, back to this rod thing, that we don't want to come with a rod and beating the sheep. We don't want to come in a destructive way. We want to come in an encouraging way. And that encouraging way is to comfort the hearts of brothers and sisters. Such an important thing for all of us. And, and there's going to be times where somebody's behavior bugs you. There's going to be times where there's something that you don't like about somebody and you want to correct them. But you know, the Holy Spirit might be telling you, be quiet. Keep your mouth closed. And the Holy Spirit's going to do it at church on Sunday. The Holy Spirit's going to do it in their prayer time. The Holy Spirit's going to do it through a family member of theirs. And it really isn't you being the Holy Spirit and playing the Holy Spirit and thinking that you have to, you know, right all the wrongs in the church or with people around you. And, and, but yet there is also the, the flip side of that, are really caring about somebody and really praying for somebody and having a time where you can speak into somebody, even a word of correction. And, the Apostle Paul one time mentioned the tone of his voice in the way that he had written. It says in Galatians 4.20, it says that I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone. He says, for I have doubts about you. And so sometimes when we do come to a person with something that we have doubts about in their life, we could come to them in a very doubtful tone or a harsh tone and to the point where it kind of invalidates what they're hearing from us. Have you ever yelled at somebody? Um, I, I've, you know, okay, I'll explain myself to you. I am a person where it's usually water off the back of a duck. And I am a person that's very easygoing. And I just don't get mad and yell. Like, I mean, you can see my kids growing up, my wife, um, and everybody that's been around me over the years. But I'll tell you what, um, maybe as I'm getting older and more crotchety, <laughs> Um, you know, in, in ministry, there have been some times where I, I think I've spoken harshly and I don't think, but, you know, on the phone, just, you know, just not understanding and, and not knowing how to communicate with somebody. And um, I, I did a study last Thursday on communication, if you want to pick that up on our, on our church website, um, if it's there, but definitely a Facebook page. And, but I want to keep a fatherly tone. I don't want people to just 
you know, get me at my wits end. I don't want to be the person that just, um, you know, I've had it up to here with something and I, and I'm trying to, you know, make my point as clear as I, I could make it. I don't want my tone to be angry. I don't want my tone to be hateful. I, I, I want it to be calm enough to be received because I don't want what I'm giving to them to be derailed from their heart. I want them to be able to receive from me. And so sometimes we have to rebuild those relationships again after there's been harshness and misunderstanding. And, and so the speaking the truth in love and also speaking through the gentleness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, you know, sometimes when we're trying to um, bring something about in somebody's life, the very tone can be the antithesis or the opposition of the thing that we're trying to accomplish in them, the helpful thing. And so a tone is something that can be changed. A, a tone is something that you can backpedal on and say, I'm sorry. And, and let me change the way that I've said that to you. And, and sometimes over the phone isn't always the nicest. A text isn't always the nicest. And so sometimes it has to be, let, let's talk in person. Let's look at my face. Let's just go back and forth on this until we've figured this out. And, and because nobody wants to hear another person squawking. People rather have a soothing tone to a voice. And, and that can penetrate a heart so, so much better if you're able to be that, that soothing medicine to the soul. And so Paul often talked about his intentions in writing. He talked about um, his fears about people. And so what we can see about the Apostle Paul when he says, I, I didn't write these things to shame you, but I, I've shared these things to warn you as, as my children, is that he was concerned about how he came off, but he wasn't afraid to show emotion. He gave warnings. He gave exhortations. And just like Jesus, you know, was appearing before Saul when he was getting saved, who had become Paul, and he falls down and Jesus says, why are you kicking against the goat? And the goat is that stick that has the nail at the end of it in order to, um, you know, prod some um, herd along. And, you know, and, and so sometimes an exhortation, it, it pokes a little bit. But God does use pastors and God does use fellow Christians to do three important things. To instigate, to inspire, and to ignite. To instigate good things in their life. To inspire and motivate good things in their life. And to ignite the memory of what it means to walk with God and have good things in their life. And God has given us for the good and not for the destruction of others. In verse 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 15 it says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So online you may have 10,000 instructors in Christ. You may one day watch Pastor John, one day watch Pastor Ray, one day watch Pastor Brian, one day watch Pastor Jeff, one day watch um, your, your wife teaching a study or whatever it might be. You got 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you know, you only had one Apostle Paul. You had only one person with the shepherd's heart. You had only one person with that fatherly attitude towards you. And that's what you got to remember at all, out of all the glitz and the glamour of Christianity out there, out of all of the lights and the smoke and the, and the bands that jump up and down. But you might have had 10,000 worship leaders and instructors in Christ, but you had only one father. You had one Apostle Paul. Now, Jesus, of course, pretty clearly said in Matthew 23, 9, that a person in, in religion and in church wasn't supposed to call another man father. And that meant as a title. It didn't mean as a relationship, as Paul spoke about begetting sons in Christ and, and bringing people to birth in the Lord. And as we plant the seeds of God in their life, which is the gospel, which is the word of God, you know what? That seed germinates and people do come to spiritual birth and they're going to look at you as Abba, as daddy. And, and you're going to be that to them spiritually. And so Paul had that place in Timothy's life. Um, in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, that's the chapter we're on, verse 17. He says that he sent Timothy, his beloved son. In Titus 1, 4, he said, Titus, my true son in the common faith. And in another place, he talks about Onesimus being his son. And so we've got to understand that if we are doing what we're supposed to be doing by discipling people and bringing them growth and bringing them 
um, you know, learning how to do things and bringing them to faith, all of that, that they're going to call us, hey, father, hey, mother, you're my, my, my spiritual parent. In 1 Thessalonians 2.11, it says, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you. And, and, a, and a charge is um, giving forth a command to do something. It says, as a father does his own children. That's what Paul said to the Thessalonian church, that we were very, very fatherly in the instructions and the way that we moved forward in your life to, to prod you guys. And then um, Hebrews 2.13 says, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Do you have any children? When you stand around the throne of God on the day that you're raptured, are you going to have children standing there with you that you brought to faith in Christ? Um, our, our, our relationship with fellow Christians is sometimes just brother or sister, but sometimes it's also mother or father. And God will develop in you as you read the Word of God, and as you mature in Christ, He will develop in you the Father's heart. And you will be able to say with concern, Oh, I hope that my children are walking in truth. I hope that all of the people at First Love Calvary Chapel, while we're out of service and waiting to get back into service, I hope they're all listening to Wednesdays. I hope they're all listening to Sundays and they're taking heed to being a part of the flock of God. Because you want to know that your children are walking in truth when you're a parent and that they're not backsliding and that they're not, you know, going off the deep end somewhere. You want to know that they're always, you know, focused on Jesus Christ, their Lord and their Savior. And so may the Lord bless a lot of those younger brothers at our church who look to myself or look to Matt or look to Jonathan or look to Sean or look to Rawl or look to Rich or, or different guys in the church that might be looking to somebody. May the Lord bless them that you could be a father to them spiritually. Um, so, so yeah, there's not many guys like the Apostle Paul. There's not many fathers in the faith like that. Um, and, and we definitely need more fathers in the faith. We need more guys that are bringing other people to birth in the Lord. And we need more mothers in the faith, like Deborah was the mother of Israel. And, and to, to be a father is to be somebody who really cares, to be somebody who really nurtures, to be somebody who really comes alongside. It's like the father that goes fishing with this kid. It's like, no, just, you know, the, the line broke, put a new line on, put a new hook on and throw it in. And the kid's all sitting there for hours trying to figure out, you know, where the hole is and figure out how to tie it. And, you know, and, and, and truly, you know, a loving father comes alongside and doesn't just make the kid swim without knowing how to swim, you know. And, and, you know, just ride that bike. Let's take off those training wheels. But, but not there to hold them and, and, and give them the confidence to, to ride on their own. And so a, a father teaches you how to take off the training wheels. Um, and, and, and a father even teaches you how to stand up for yourself or even how to fight if necessary. And, and so have you begotten somebody in your life that you're passing on all the important things of Christ to them? Um, or, which you would think is a bad thing, that if somebody gave birth to a child and they left that child, that baby, by a dumpster, or they just, um, you know, failed to care for that child and let the child tragically, and I'm just speaking hypothetically here, even though things like this do happen, but to, to starve to death in a crib. And, and you would think, oh, my word, that was absolute abuse and, and evil. And, and yet so often in the church, people do not have that fatherly and motherly instinct toward others. Now, sometimes it is because they've never had a child. And if you've never had a child and you don't haven't developed some of that nurturing instinct or never had a spouse and developed also that nurturing instinct, get yourself a pet and, and, and take care of people. Start taking care of somebody. Do things for people and, and get that father's heart. And so we've got to plant those seeds, the gospel, the word of God, and watch it develop, water it, and, and bring forth some good fruit in people's lives. Bring them to maturity, to that father state of walking. As in First John, it says, I write to you little children. I write to you young men. And then the third step is I write to you fathers. And that is the third step of spiritual growth right there. Now in verse 16, in the book of First Corinthians chapter 14, and that's our chapter that we're on today, First Corinthians chapter, not 14, but chapter four. See, you caught it before I did. Um, verse 16, it says, therefore, I urge you 
imitate me. Okay, that's a pretty big phrase, isn't it? If you were to ask somebody to imitate you, to mimic you, to repeat after you, to live like you, to do as you do. I've seen kids, and I remember my own kids, you know, and they put their foot on your foot. You know, if I can even show you my feet now, I don't even think I can lift my foot that high. Let's see here, let's see here. Ah, there, there we go, okay. To, they put their feet on each of your feet, and then you walk with them, and they're walking on your feet. Or they put on your shoes because they want to walk in dad's shoes. And so that kind of thing, that's cute. But what it is, is it shows that they're, they, they're imitating you. They're, they're wanting to grow up. They're wanting to be like you, even though they don't even fully understand that. And, and the scriptures talk about in the last days, something that's going to happen in families. It says in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, that's the last book in your Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says, I will, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Behold, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, Jesus said that that Elijah was spiritually John the Baptist. But it says, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. One of the brothers, um, Chris Hammond, that's at our church, was sharing that verse with me the other day, and he was saying that before the coming of the Lord, as there was a plan that the hearts of families would turn toward one another, and taking a look at the coronavirus situation, and people were forced to be in their homes, and people's hearts were turned back home, and, and families were turned back toward one another all over the world. And that's a very interesting thing if, if that was also the same kind of a thing, not you know, that Elijah's around right now, but just that the hearts of families are being turned toward each other and people are remembering what's really important before the coming of the Lord. Um, but if you are imitatable, that's my word, imitate able. If you were, what is imitatable in your life? As a dad, what would you want your sons to be like? As a mom, how would you want your daughters to cook meals and take care of a husband? And, and so brothers and friends, all of us should have things with one another and sisters that we can be imitatable. Let's try saying that word, even though it's not really a word. It's too, you know, a little compound there. Um, but there have been times in my life where I've thought that I've been more imitatable than other times. And there have been certain ways that are very imitatable and then certain ways when you see, oh, um, what, what is that phrase? Oh, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. But those times where you're just going, I'm not so imitatable. But if we get that father's heart of gentleness and that father's heart of love, then we are imitatable that even though we personally fall short in certain ways, yet in the ways that he's wanting us to represent him and shine for him, we're also somebody that can be looked at and go, wow, I like that in that person. I see Jesus in them. And all of those that have died in the faith, but died holding fast to the faith, are imitatable because they held fast until the very end. And, and all of those men that died in the faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and women, guess what? They died in the faith. And that's encouraging because that's the most imitatable thing of all is that when you do die in your last breath, did you deny Christ or are you in the faith? Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, for this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. There he says it. 10,000 teachers, but only one father in Christ. Well, Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere and in every church. So what a faithful son does is he represents the father that he was born from. And you, you know what happens is, you can hear in my sons, Josiah and Elijah, you can hear my voice. You can see my mannerisms. Oh, they're not me. They're their own man, their own person. But there's definitely um, that representation, that express image of the father that they came from. And so they do, when you see them, if you talk them long enough, they remind you of me. Now, if you knew them and you saw me, it'd be vice versa. But Paul said, I, as I'm teaching, as I'm on this teaching circuit in every place, I'm able to send him. I'm able to trust him. I'm able to know that this young man, this guy will represent me. And 
you know, that particular thing, that, that's a hard thing to find. Paul said that I haven't found anybody else like-minded except for Timothy. And I'll tell you what, men do have their own agendas. Men do have their own ideas. Men do have their own visions for their life. And to get two men aligned and two men on the same page, and, and even one to come alongside and receive in such a way that they would imitate at least the good things, that is you know, almost an impossibility. Not that it's impossible, because Paul said that he found one, and he called Timothy his son. And, and so when somebody is your son in the faith, it's, you know, hands down, no questions asked that this person perfectly represents what I would consider a person who understands me and is walking with me and, and a guy who I can trust to run to take it to the victory. Um, this guy, my son in the faith, is the best player. He, he does it with ease. And, and so is there somebody that you can look at like Timothy in your life? that he'll do what you want, your bidding, and remind you, Paul says, he'll remind you of my ways, because you'll see my ways in him. He'll speak to you about my ways, and, and so he'll represent my ministry the way I want it to be represented. And so when you're ever discipling another brother or another sister, sisters, um, they're not going to be just like you, but it says that when a person has learned, they do become like their teacher. And they then find a way to be able to um, represent your views more accurately. Oh, well, you know, somebody else might misunderstand you, but they'll be able to explain you like, like a spouse could. And so do you follow somebody's ways? Is there something good that you see in somebody? And you're going, man, I followed this and this and this because, you know, that is very admirable. And this Timothy guy and maybe the Titus guy and the Onesimus guy, Paul had to see some things in them that they were receptive they were able to learn. They were able to imitate. They were submissive. Um, they were respectful receivers. They were able to take instructions and follow them. And yet there is no guy that can perfectly do that. But yet look at also with following Christ. None of us perfectly follow Christ. But do we imitate him? Yes. Is he imitatable? Yes. Do we perfectly imitate everything of him? Well, you know, we're, we're fighting that, that good fight of faith and fighting against that, that sinful nature part of us. And so there are very few Timothys, but we can all try to be a Paul. We can all try to be a Timothy. And, and so here's one of the things he talked about. Um, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, to Timothy himself, he said, But you have carefully followed my doctrine. You've, you've followed my teachings, Timothy. You've followed my manner of life as I'm living for the Lord. You followed my faith in Christ. You followed my long suffering that I have toward people. You've followed my walk of love. You followed my perseverance through all of the trials and afflictions that I go through. And so he mentions all of that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Now, back to our scripture, okay? And reminder, those of you that tuned in late, because you got to get all the way to the beginning and catch this. But you know, do you want to come at people with a rod? Do you want to beat people? Or do you want to encourage people? Do you want to, you know, not spare in beating the flock, beating the sheep? Or do you want to, you know, realize that God has given you um, as an encouragement to your brothers and sisters around you? So it says in verse 18, it says, Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. Some people are arrogant as though I said I'm coming, but I'm really not going to come. Like I won't stand by my word. Paul's not going to do what he said he's going to do. And, you know, when, when Paul talks, his letters are very strong, but when he's in person, you know, he's, he's weak. And so Paul had some words going around about him like that. And, but Paul said, if, actually, if I say I'm going to come to you, as long as the Lord allows it to happen, I'm sticking by my word. And I'm going to tell you something. If you told somebody you're going to call somebody, if you told somebody you're going to follow through with something, it's very important, brothers and sisters, if you want to be an imitatable person, is to be a person that sticks by their word. And so Paul needed to visit the Corinthian church. And sometimes with people, visits are necessary. And I want to tell you this, that even though this time of us having not been back into church yet, I have not only given my number away, but I'm going to tell you, and I promise you, if you need me to come and visit you for a particular reason, I'll stand outside of the church, I'll stand outside of your house, we'll do our little six-foot distancing, but if you need some in-person encouragement or prayer, um, I don't want to forsake the flock. 
and I will not come with a rod, but I will come in the gentleness of Christ. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, it says, therefore, when I was planning this, like when I was planning to come to you, did I, did I take my plans lightly? Or the things that I plan, do I plan it according to the flesh? Like I say, I'm going to do something and then I really don't do it. You know, people are really nice. They tell you, they go, yeah, 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 I'll do it. And then they don't. Or they say, no, no. And then they still don't connect with you on it. And so Paul said, I don't, I don't make my plans like that. And then in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says in verses 19 and 20, of chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, it says, But I will come to you shortly. I am going to. And if the Lord wills, I will know. Not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. So those people who say that Paul's really not going to come, and yet, you know, maybe they sound so confident, but are they walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, guess what? When I come, I'm going to come in the power of the Holy Spirit. He said in verse 20, here's a great verse, guys. This is one of those underlinable verses in your Bible. Okay, got it? And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. It says, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Sometimes people think that pastors are just this guy behind a pulpit. Sometimes they think that they're just, you know, a, a talking head on a, on a video screen right now. And, and the truth is, is it's got to be not just a bunch of talk. It can't just be a bunch of talk. It's got to be prayer. It's got to be hearing from the Lord. It's got to be the power of the Holy Spirit and the power using us toward the church of God, for sure. That we want to make sure that, you know, when, when the curtains, like in the movie Wizard of Oz, when the curtains are pulled away, I am Oz, you know, and then you see this old, older guy. But you know what? At, at the very end, you saw that this guy still had a lot of wisdom. And it wasn't just the, the smoke and the big screen and the, the all-powerful Oz. That the guy had some, some great practical and simple wisdom. And, and so behind the big band on stage, behind the, the, the big screen with the words on it, behind the, the powerful preaching, is it just words or is it the power of the Holy Spirit? What? What do we want, right? And so, so make sure that when you um, come and are a part of the flock of God, that you're there to add to that presence and that power. You're not there to just drain everybody. Um, you know, where we all have problems on our plate, but you're able to cast your cares on the Lord and then be an asset to the body of Christ. Um, because the kingdom of God isn't all about even moping. It's not all about just talking. It's not all about just pouring out your heart and telling somebody how problematic your life is. Um, it's not that we don't ever do that, but the kingdom of God isn't just a bunch of talk. It's a Holy Spirit empowered life. And so those of you who are always you know, seeming like you're grasping for the negative in your life and it almost comforts you in a way that you don't even recognize it to always have something negative to share. Why don't you call out for the power of the Holy Spirit? Why don't you get a baptism of the Holy Spirit and start speaking in tongues and prophesying? Go back to the book of Acts, dear brother or sister. And, and so the Lord is going to um, show up even before the apostle Paul does. And, and sometimes the Lord will get us someplace in his will sooner than we think. Like, for instance, we want to open um, the church building. The church is always open, right? Because we are the church and Christ is in our hearts. And yet the church united and the church gathered is what Jesus intends for the flock, right? The, the gathering of the flock. And, and I believe that even that, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will happen sooner than we even think. And, and you know, we're not just going to see a bunch of guys coming back to, the, to their pulpits who you know, say they've heard from God, but maybe haven't heard from God. Maybe we've seen a bunch of guys now going to Mount Sinai and having that one-on-one -on -one experience with the Lord, and they're going to come back to their pulpit with greater power. Um, it's not going to be a bunch of guys ranting about how bad the culture is going and how things are all going downhill, but it's going to be a bunch of guys that are not just a bunch of words, but you know, coming forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so let, let's get our voices back behind those pulpits soon. Let's get that power seen among God's people when they're all together worshiping the Lord. Let's see his ways together and through the church and for the glory of God. Verse 21, verse 21 says, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of gentleness? That is the theme of my verse. There we go, guys. Anybody who stayed with me, should I come at you with a rod or should I come to you with this rod? What do you want? 
It says, or should I come to you in love? In love, encouragement, gentleness. It's a choice of how you might want to see somebody come to you in the way that you might also come to them. Paul didn't want to come off as mad and irritated and bothered and rebuking. And that wasn't his wish whatsoever. He'd rather come off fatherly and caring. And, and it, I'm, you know, pastors aren't into breaking the, the legs of the sheep, but to walking with the stick, the big stick of spiritual love and gentleness and kindness. And so what are you emanating from your life, dear brother or sister? What, what's springing forth from that well within you? What's live streaming from your mouth today? Are you projecting the gentleness and love of God as a man or woman of God? Or are you bringing forth just stringent legalism and meanness and unkindness? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19, it says, But we do all things, beloved, for your edification. That's it. Not to beat the sheep, but for your edification. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you as I wish. May, he, may, may, may the Lord find us as he wishes when he comes, right? That's, it. That's Paul talking about the Corinthian church, though. And then 2 Corinthians 12, that was um, 2 Corinthians 12, 19 and 20. 2 Corinthians 12, 21 says, When I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned. And then 2 Corinthians 13, verses 2 and 3 and Paul talks about that when I come again, I will not spare. In other words, he might have to um, be very serious and abrupt with his warning. And so Paul was walking in the edification of Christ. And, and the end of 2 Corinthians, I'm closing right now. The end of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 says, Lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given to me for edification and not for destruction. God has given Paul to edify or to build up the church and not destroy their hearts, not to shame them. And so you and I, when we come at the flock, once again, that great reminder, we can come at the word of God and, and, and as a soothing ointment and healing ointment, or we can come at them with the word of God as a rod and, and beating them with it. And, and you decide how you want to be treated. And you decide if you are going to be the edifier or you are going to be the destroyer. Because God wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit to make the church a very encouraging place where there's exhortations and there's warnings and there's tones of voice sometimes, but there's a whole lot of love and a whole lot of receptivity because we know that Christ is speaking through us. All right, you guys. Well, God bless you. And I'm going to pray for salvation right now. And so if you need to rededicate your life to Christ or get saved, that means ask Jesus in your heart by confessing that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the flock of God and bless them with the message they heard just now. And Lord, if there is one backslider that hears my voice right now, just pray and say, Lord, I return to you. Say that. Lord, I come back to you. Lord, I don't want to stray anymore. Coming back into the flock now to follow you, Lord, as that shepherd of my soul. Lord, forgive me for my straying. I have now returned in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're getting born again right now, say, Lord, make me born from above. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Lord, I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you now into my heart. I repent of my sins, Lord. That means I turn from my sins because I give them to you to cleanse me. Oh, Lord, you took my sins upon yourself on that cross. See, I speak fast, but just say it. Say, Lord, you took my sins upon yourself on that cross. And so, Lord, save my soul now and make me born again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys. Spirit of love or the spirit of the rod, I know what choice I'm going to make. How about you? God bless you guys. Good evening, First Love Calvary Chapel. Uh, let's go ahead and get started into worship, and I will pray. Uh, Jesus, thank you, God, for this worship, God, that we are going to have right now. And although it's been recorded even um, times before this real event as we're watching it and experience it and worshiping you, Lord, in, in, this, in this moment, Lord, um, I know, Lord, that you hold the future in your hands and so you know what we're going to 
here in the word, you know, where our hearts will be, you know, what we just experienced through the, the whole day of Wednesday, um, and days leading up to Wednesday. And so God, you, you know, all things and you know what we need, Lord. So may these songs minister to us. May they be like water to our souls, Lord, as we worship and as we sing your name and your praises and the truth about who you are. Um, fill us with your Holy Spirit and allow these songs to just really um, just allow us to pour our hearts out to you, God, to sing unto you and to worship you for who you are. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name. Amen.
you, Lord God, that you are the Father in heaven. You are the Spirit inside, and you are Jesus who loves. Thank you so much, Lord, for those great, great truths, Lord, and the reality for that, what that is. Thank you, Jesus.
last song, let's go ahead and pray for the tithes and the offering. Let's just try to be faithful to continue to to give to the Lord as we always have when it's we attended church, you know, just knowing that that it's due it's due his name and he's he's deserving of so much more than ten percent of our wages and our and our money and just the fact that he only asked for ten percent, so little compared to to the whole 90 that we keep. So, um, yeah, let's just be faithful servants to God and, and continue to just give whatever it is really that He's placed on your heart, um, whether it's less or more. It's between you and the Lord. So I'm just going to pray for that right now. Um, Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for just another another day of living, God, another day um, you've given us breath and you've given us life. And so... Lord, I pray that your hand will be upon the tithes and the offerings, Lord, especially in such a difficult time, Lord, when when everyone seems to just be financially unstable and uh, maybe not knowing where their next meal is even going to come from or their next paycheck. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that the money that is given, Lord, that you would use it for your kingdom, for your glory, Lord, that we would use it to help those that are in need and um, just to further your kingdom, God. And I pray that would multiply everything that is given, Lord, that it would be miraculous, God, the, the way that you provide for your church here at First Love Calvary Chapel, not just in means of, of bills and um, necessity, God, but that you would just provide abundantly, Lord, in all areas, Lord, so that ministries can thrive and um, that families can thrive, Lord. So we, we give all of these things up to you, God.
Amen. Lord God, I pray that you go before the rest of our evenings, the rest of our weeks, and that we would continue to see you, Lord, shining um, just the path before us, God, and that we follow you and go wherever you lead us. Pray these things in Jesus' name.